I feel like there's a very fine line to draw between modern indie games and obscure and just weird games from mostly the 6th generation. Yeah, you might know what I'm talking about. Stuff like Cubivore, Ribbit King, Killer7, Chibi Robo, Chulip, Katamari Damacy, Gift Pia, and countless others that I probably haven't even heard of. Like, yeah, indie games nowadays can be pretty damn unique in their own right, but, you know, I find a little more interest in PS2 and GameCube era games where a majority were made by Japanese developers with such strange, almost out of this world gameplay mechanics that you'd undoubtedly never find in anything else at the same time, while squeezing as much charm as they could into the experience itself. And that kind of brings me to Doshin, or Doshin, I don't know. Back in August, when talking a bunch about Cubivore and Frogs, I still got reminded of another obscure GameCube game that's definitely in the same vein as it. I've definitely known about its existence before, probably through Did You Know Game Ing, and that was of course Doshin the Giant. Weirdly enough, this game shares quite a few similarities with Cubivore in terms of its general history. See, it was first originally developed by Param for the 64DD, as well as an exclusive expansion, but unlike Cubivore, it actually came out there, which is like really cool actually to think that was one of the very few that sought the light of day. Also, Param, what did they make? Literally just Doshin. It then got a re-release on GameCube in 2002, and while it did come out in Europe, a North American version was apparently cancelled, and I can't really concretely find out why. Also, surprisingly enough, Wikipedia says that this was the ninth best-selling game of 2002 in Japan, and is overall the 22nd best-selling GameCube game. So, yeah, it was apparently a success, unlike Cubivore, unfortunately, but that begs the question, why is this in Cubivore, in Smash Bros. Melee? Yeah, I feel like that's why most people have at least heard of these two very obscure games. They look at this character in their Smash Bros. and think, Love Giant? And because of that, they're still technically a part of Nintendo's history, which is kinda neat. But I really want to know what Doshin the Giant even is. I mean, I've wanted to try out this game for several months. It's always just eluded me in such a strange way. I've probably only ever seen four screenshots of this game, and they all look like a f fever dream. All this mystery makes me very excited and intrigued to see what it's about. So let's do this. I've wanted to see just what this game was all about for quite a while, and it's kind of fun to finally see it happen. Let's see what a Doshin the Giant really is. So, upon starting the game, you get treated to its first cutscene showcasing Baruto Island, where the villagers are patiently waiting for the big man to come around and help the humans. This big man is actually, yup, Doshin the Giant, who rises from the middle of the sea. During this, it has some pretty intimidating music for him, but like, it just doesn't fit his appearance at all. I mean, his alternative name is literally Love Giant. How can you look at this guy and think he's scary? He's just so happy, and he's got a weird belly button. Nah, real talk, he's got a very simple yet good design. I like it. And alongside that, he's lacking in height, which is pretty apparent to the villagers. And then we just jump into gameplay like this. It's also quickly established that we have a character narrating the entire game and Doshin's actions. His name is Sidoru. He acts as like the tips and tricks guy of this game, telling you basic info you really should know. Honestly, it kind of irks me that whatever he says never really lines up with the written subtitles. The giant can pick up people and carry them to different villages. Kind of weird, but whatever. And that's pretty much it for story and characters. I mean, very simple stuff that just doesn't waste your time. And alright, so what exactly am I looking at here? Well, to put it bluntly, Doshin the Giant is a god simulator, which is pretty interesting as that's definitely a genre I don't see implemented many times nowadays, especially for its time. That's pretty unique. And really, the basic goals of this game just include helping your fellow little humans spawned on this world. Yes, these little guys. At first, they're split up into four main races, or colors, and you'll really just be helping them by doing very, very basic tasks. They just boil down to giving them a tree for some good old green energy and growth, and lowering or raising the terrain for more land. This all will insinuate them to build different structures, like houses and fences and even monuments. There are these special structures that basically denote that the village is complete. Whenever the villagers are ready for one, you always see a little flower icon on top of their head. How do you get flowers? Well, you just have to gather seven trees together and boom, you spawn a flower just like that. 
but you can only have one in the world at a time. You give that to them and, hey, relax at this point, because that little cone sparkly thingy, I don't know, it basically assures you that's a regulation monument they're building and that will actually count towards your grid list. See, the bigger goal of this game is to build all 16 monuments, which you might be thinking is impossible with only four separate villages at the start, but we'll get to that later. Now, if you don't get a flower for them in due time, then they'll go ahead and build what's called a non-regulation monument. Basically, it's just a bad monument. That's it. And that's clearly denoted by the structure itself looking like poop, and the village itself having this discordant and unpleasant music playing when you go near it. That also means you probably gotta destroy it and try again, and actually bring the flower to them this time. I do kinda wish the humans didn't go ahead and build the poop monument without your consent if you don't get the flower in time. Not giving it to them because you were focused on helping another color of humans, well, that can get understandably frustrating sometimes. But I always found it was super helpful to spawn a flower and throw it near the village just to be super safe. Other than that, there's also natural disasters. I'm honestly just kind of whatever on these. I see these more of as a minor annoyance than an actual obstacle you have to overcome. They just serve to mostly destroy villages you've worked up. There are ways of preventing them for sure, but stuff like the tornado and volcano, I mean, there's no stopping this. This is out of control. Uh, okay, is this making sense? Because I gotta be honest, while what I just said right there may sound confusing, it's actually not really. You just gotta help your villagers and when they need a flower, give it to them so they can build their special monument. And even in comparison to something like Cubivore, where I thought the game was pretty confusing with its own mechanics, Doshin the Giant is actually a lot simpler when you get down to it. Now, controlling Doshin himself, he's really slow. Yes, this is his standard original starting walking speed, and it is brutal. But if you gain enough love from the villagers, which are these little heart icons right here, and they form a circle on your screen, well, you grow bigger. Now you're definitely a giant if you grow this big, and with this, it makes the basic task a lot easier. Terraforming is better now that you have a wider range, and walking across the world is much faster. At the start of each day, you start off at your original bearing, so you'll have to work up to it again, which can kind of be agonizing when dealing with this abysmal walking speed. But being giant itself isn't always the best thing, as the game reminds you. You gotta really be careful when stepping through these minuscule villages, careful not to destroy one of the houses or something, because this can happen. And this. Oh, and this. There is a hidden side to Doshin I haven't discussed yet and it might be one of the most evil things in video game history. Slamming L on the controller triggers Doshin's darker and more sinister alter ego, Joshin. Joshin, again, I have no clue. In comparison to Doshin, he seems to be a lot more agile and efficient. He walks a little faster, he can jump insane heights and slowly float down with his trusty wings, but he also easily scares the villagers, and he can't carry things. He can only destroy them. That evil bastard! Doing some of this stuff causes you to get these skulls, which also help you grow in the exact same way as love hearts. And since they're much faster to farm because of this, you might be tempted to play as Joshin. But of course, destroying villages while fun and stuff, gaining their love from the humans there again will take quite a while, and it comes to a point where I didn't really do it all for my playthrough. Sometimes they may even hate you on the spot of seeing you, even as Doshin. Like, damn, that sucks. I always found it way more rewarding and satisfying to just build love from these villagers instead of hate. Now, for the monuments, if you want to get all 16, you will have to mix races, which is hinted by the color combinations of the pictures on this monument list. It just involves bringing a human from one color village to another, and boom, you got it. Or alternatively, you could start a brand new village with a male and female from one village and another just like that, which I think is much cooler. It's just neat to see these villages start off as nothing, slowly build into actual living spaces where these little guys roam around, plopping down trees and seeing it liven up the place in real time. Sometimes you tend to the villagers for a while and leave, then come back to see how much progress they've made and that's just ultimately satisfying. Getting closer to these tiny civilizations, hearing all the sound effects, the little tunes they play, noticing how all these humans are doing something individually, like rolling on a ball, playing with a hula hoop. Oh my god, they're praying to the giant! You know, this like super reminds me of the satisfying progression nature of Pikmin. I mean, you're also seeing little guys working on these goals, carrying stuff around. And in Doshin, this also includes monuments. Slowly filling out the list is oh so nice. Totally gives me the same feeling of gaining all the ship parts or treasures in the first two Pikmin games. 
and once you're at the end of the 30 minute day and you see the sunset, it feels pretty damn good, clocking in all your work. You get some human feedback too, which I never really figured out what exact purpose they serve. Are they supposed to help me or something? You don't care about the earth. Um, yeah I do. What are you talking about, dude? Oh yeah, and I kind of forgot to delve deeper into the terraforming mechanic of this game, a giant part of Doge and the Giant. Yeah. Basically, you can shape land into any form you want, which is actually, like, super technically impressive. Yeah, there's no restrictions on this. You can make pretty much anything you want. You want to make a river? Why not? Form a small mountain? Sure! Want to play baseball with it? Go ahead! You can make an island that's for a new village and it's all completely customizable. Like, this is super cool. The fact that this is on GameCube back in 2002. Jesus. And it's even more amazing that this is also running on 64DD. Holy crap. Not great performance wise, but still. And you know, the GameCube graphics themselves are okay. Nothing really to write home about. But when you see that this terraforming mechanic had to come first, I appreciate the visuals a lot more. Like sure, you can definitely see some cracks form, like random polygons missing in the distance or some poppin', but nothing really that bad to be fair. This kind of easy and accessible customization with the world also contributes to how free you generally feel in this game. You could plop any tree anywhere, you can go all evil and throw buildings into water, you could slide off mountains for some reason. You can walk off the edge of the world. There's absolutely no reason, it just does a game over and forces you to start the day over. Kinda weird, but alright. Of course, all this freedom did come at a cost though. I've heard that the save file for this game is worth 40 freaking blocks on a memory card. And keep in mind, standard GameCube memory cards were 251 blocks. Uh, that's quite a lot when that's considered. And my best assumption is that it has to save all the positions of the trees, all the positions of the houses, buildings, and every change you've made to the land during that day. That's pretty wild. And for what it is, Dosha the Giant is actually a pretty pleasant experience. Like, I actually enjoyed it a lot more than what I was initially expecting. And yeah, on the surface it definitely seems like there's not a lot to do, and I could totally see why people would pass on this game. Heck, I don't even know if I've convinced anybody to play this game by saying all this, but I really see this as less than a game and more of just a leisurely experience. It's super chill and relaxing, there's no rush to anything at all, and it's something you can just mindlessly play around without paying critical attention to. While other games try to have challenging boss fights or enemies or something, Doshin the Giant strips out a way for something way more relaxed that's up to your own liking. While the gameplay doesn't have a lot to it, honestly, you'll just be helping out humans doing like two different tasks. It's definitely mostly just the charm of seeing your little guys have fun down there, and seeing more monuments pop up. And at the very least, its approach to gameplay is something that I can't say is exactly normal, which is good. Although I will mention, I think the game's biggest flaw might just be... Yeah, it's Sidoru. Not the character itself, mostly just the fact that this game doesn't do a great job at explaining the basic stuff. For some instances, it's fine, but for example, flowers. Sidoru does explain that there can only be one flower in existence at a time, but when the villagers use a flower in this cone formation, you actually can spawn another flower and give it to another color of village. This saves a lot of time, I find, and it's kind of weird the game never tells you. Another thing I think is worthy of knowing is that when you have to destroy a monument, you don't have to turn into Joshin to destroy it. Just sink the monument by lowering the ground, and for some reason the humans don't blame you. I also found it generally helpful to appease the slow walking speed by switching to Joshin to jump great distances, but then turn into Doshin right before the humans can see you. Yeah, I clearly stole these tips from these two videos, but they're great videos, trust me. Also, 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 pretty important, but whenever the humans want you to change the terrain in some way and you can't satisfy them no matter what you do, it's a sign that you just need to make flat, spacious terrain in front of them because more often than not, they want to build something there. But making flat terrain can also be clunky and finicky as hell, mostly when you're big. It's just so annoying. But all you gotta do is hold X and Y at the same time. This will level the ground in front of you and make anything perfectly flat. Oh my god, this made these little situations a breeze. I literally felt like a new human being when I discovered this. But then the next day, it just didn't work. But then later on, it started working again. What the hell? 
My best guess is that you have to be a certain size or this feature doesn't work, which is strange. It's also super weird that Sidora never mentions this apparently hidden feature of the game. In fact, some of his explanations of things I found kind of vague. The lazy human knows where the treasure is. Try to walk around while holding the lazy human. Okay, uh, I don't know what that means at all though. Honestly, if you want to get the most enjoyment out of Doge and the Giant, then you might need to console a walkthrough as you're playing. Again, the in-game dialogue does a fine job for some mechanics, but others, it's a little confusing. But don't worry too much, because soon enough you'll be enjoying the game a lot more once you know the basics, at least in my time. And finally, other than that, this can really just boil down to a minor nitpick, but that slow walking speed I touched on earlier, well, you kinda have to just in it when actually carrying something, and this includes villagers. If you want to make a new village far away on a distant island, well, have fun with this. And yeah, I think that about covers everything. And now, I'll discuss what happens once you get all 16 monuments. The ending. If you don't want to get spoiled for some reason, I'll just put this here just in case. Although, I don't think any of you care. <laughs> Well, after getting all 15 monuments, you can finally build the hidden 16th monument, which is a huge replica of what looks like the Tower of Babel. Towards the end of this game, Sidora mentions that the construction of the final monument may result in the end of Baruto Island. Well, I guess we're gonna FIND OUT! We then see a cutscene of the tower falling down, with the world cracking apart. Luckily, Doshin comes to save the day, well, tries to. During this, Sidora states some pretty profound messages. In this darkness, I will sleep. My consciousness is getting thinner. This all results in the birth of a new island vaguely shaped like Doshin himself. After walking in game a bit, we find some alien looking guys who want a flower. So of course we gotta give them one, they're gonna build a monument. But not just any monument, a rocket ship which I assume will take them back to their homeland. And that's how the game ends. It's strangely kind of dark. I'm sure the developers wanted this ending to have some kind of deeper meaning, something that has to do with reincarnation or something. I'm not sure, but I sure as hell wasn't expecting it from Doshin the Giant though. I do kind of like it this way. It left me with a slightly off-putting feeling when I first saw it. Weirdly, the best word I'd use to describe it is Bittersweet? Well, that was it. Oh, and then credits. What? Giles Goddard? Oh yeah, Giles Goddard. You know, the guy who made Mario's head in Mario 64. Also was a programmer for Doshin the Giant. Actually, that makes so much sense. The terraforming and how you get to shape it into whatever you want. That must have been carried over from being able to mess with Mario's face. That's super cool, actually. Yeah, Doshin the Giant. I thought it was pretty good actually like yeah there's not much to do in this game and that can definitely drive a lot of people away from it but for what it was trying to do just be a chill and relaxing game for anyone to sit down and enjoy it did fairly well in my opinion it's just like a lovely experience man going through seeing all your villagers having fun building stuff it's just so pleasant it was for sure a nice change of pace for me as i just got off the high heels playing through resident evil 4 for the first time Oh, thank God. And after a hard day's work, you can finally see the sunset and just relax. And God, this music is so good, actually. Like, holy crap, it's so relaxing, tropical, and strangely kind of psychedelic and surreal. I feel like there was way more to Doshin the Giant I could say was good than Q before. And that's why I think it would be super neat to see this God Simulator genre tried again in a similar formula for a modern game or something. Like, take this idea, having the entire world be fully malleable and at your disposal, going wild with terraforming, and just implement it into to a new game. God Sims are definitely one of the more obscure genres of gaming. I haven't really heard of it actually, so it would be very cool to see something like it. It was the same thing I said with Cubivore, how that game had a surprisingly strategic overarching mechanic, and that's partly why I like checking these bizarre Japanese games out, to see why they stand out from the rest for a good reason. I'm not saying we should get a Doshin sequel or a remake, or even a port for that matter. I highly doubt it'll happen. Like, I'm not even saying you should even really play it. I just wanted to make this video to talk about it. Its fan base, though quite small, is very devoted, and the game deserves way more appreciation. 
It's short, but it never rushes you and always keeps the positive and peaceful vibes going. And when I look at it from those lens, I appreciate the game a lot more. But yeah, thanks for watching my new video on a stupid baby colorful game. I know it's been a while since my last real new video. No, not counting the Partners in Time one. I was working on a Metroid Dread video, but that got scrapped. So... Yeah, thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it, and anyways, I hope to see you again someday where we'll cover something else. I don't know. Bye.